What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So now, what feels like forever, right? It feels like it's been a while since we started talking about the Joy-Con drift issues that have popped up all over the place for the Switch Joy-Cons. Well, Nintendo has finally acknowledged it, even apologizing and talking a bit about uh, why they can't necessarily comment further on it. We're gonna go over that. They also kind of talked a little bit about Nintendo Direct, something we haven't seen in a, a long time now, also it feels like. And we have to go over Crash Bandicoot 4 because while we talked about how the Xbox store was showing some sort of in-app purchases, we now have a response from Toys for Bob and Activision about if there really will be microtransactions in this game. We'll see about that one because CTR wasn't supposed to have them either, huh? As always guys, if you enjoyed these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if you're brand new here, hit the red subscribe button down below as we head towards 500,000 subscribers. And we're gonna start today with Ghost of Tsushima. And that is a game coming out pretty soon. We're into July now, which means we're less than three weeks away from Ghost and Paper Mario. They're both coming out the same day, July 17th. I'm excited grabbing both of them, probably starting with Ghost and then working my way over after a few hours Paper Mario to get that started. But we now know when the embargo will lift, at least for the reviews on Ghost of Tsushima. And we can see Metacritic even put it out here after several people basically just started saying what the embargo was on Twitter. People who are reviewing it and showed us the title screen as well. But you can see Metacritic says reviews will start going up at 7 a.m. Pacific on July 14th. Hmm, so they're asking for way too early Metacritic score predictions. I, for Ghost, I am going to go, I'm gonna go 87 overall with Ghost when it's all said and done and everything levels out because it could start really high and then work the score down. It could start low and then work up. I'm gonna go with 87 though. I think it. I think so far from what we've seen, it looks good, looks interesting and, and at least fun to explore for, for what we've seen, but well, we heard it's a very small area that we, we've seen initially. So like, I need to know if it gets that open world fatigue, you know what I mean? Where like the world just feels too big and empty in spots to where you're just like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll navigate through a lot of open area that has no real purpose. And it's just big to be big, big. So here, here's hoping that is not the case. Uh, but well, I guess we'll find out July 14th with the scores and then obviously July 17th and I'll give my thoughts on the game after I get a chance to play it later on. Also, do you remember Crucible? It's a game that came out kind of recently. Of course, it was this big game by Amazon. They put it out there and wasn't received the greatest. And since then, concurrent player count for this game, especially on Steam, has been low. Like we're talking less than 200 people for a game that cost uh, almost a literal fortune for Amazon to put out there. It's supposed to be their big game. There's gonna be this big landmark thing that they put out. And uh, guess what? It's now going into closed beta. That might sound weird, since it already released. And I don't know if I've ever seen this before. I was trying to figure this out. I'm like, have I seen a game release and then go backwards into closed beta. I, I can't think of anything. You can let me know down below if, if that's happened before, but a free to play game that struggles to get over 200 concurrent players probably has some issues. And apparently the community around Crucible, the, the small community that's there has been asking for this to kind of fix things up, balance the game and play around just overall mechanics. So at least going into closed beta and even pulling it off of Steam will allow them to take a step back and maybe play around with the game a bit more. But it is, uh, it is surprising to see a game that Amazon was putting all this money into and hyping up have to now go backwards into closed beta. I'll be curious, the big thing, if it ever comes out of closed beta. Oh, and check this out, we have some Wii U news. It's not great news necessarily, but it is Wii U news. And that is, well, the Wii U is losing its browser ability to play YouTube videos. There's still that app for YouTube, so I guess you could still use that. But I do know people actually like to use the browser function on the Wii U quite a bit, and that would also include watching YouTube videos seemingly on the browser. Now, YouTube, of course, just doesn't wanna support it anymore because well, there's probably not a lot of people using the browser specifically for YouTube on the Wii U now. I'm sure they can see the numbers, they know themselves. So at least right now you'll have to use the app. And of course, who knows how long that'll even be supported. That could be discontinued by the end of the year for all we know. But yes, the Wii U is slowly fading away. The game's being pulled over to the Switch and now we're seeing YouTube kind of walking away from it. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get in the bigger stuff. We're gonna start right away with the Nintendo financial Q&A that actually showed Nintendo acknowledge the Joy-Con malfunctions, specifically, we all figured the Joy-Con drift because they even mentioned a lawsuit and they even talked a little bit about the Nintendo Direct. Now, the Directs have, uh, 
Well, we haven't had one in about over 300 days now. This is September 2019 when we had the last one. And you know what? We might get a full year, possibly September 2020, before we see another one. And that even might be optimistic. But let me go over to what uh, Shintaro Furukawa, of course, Nintendo president, had to say about the Joy-Cons. Regarding the Joy-Con, we apologize for any trouble caused to our customers. We are continuing to aim to improve our products, but as the Joy-Con is the subject of a class action lawsuit in the United States, and this is still a pending issue, we would like it to re we would like to refrain from responding about any specific actions. So there is that class action lawsuit. And you know what? I, Nintendo's taking it seriously. They don't want to admit fault about any specific issue while they are fighting a class action lawsuit about the Joy-Con drift. Now, this is good news because they are acknowledging it publicly to the world and to their investors that yes, they are apologizing because there was a malfunction, very general malfunction with the Joy-Con themselves. And I hope that means that Nintendo has been isolating the issue with that Joy-Con drift and they are working to resolve it behind the scenes, specifically with engineers, designers, and all this for the Joy-Con and that joystick. That's something remains to be seen. Hopefully at some point we see a massive model number change on the back of a Joy-Con. We open it up and things are just different and they went ahead and resolved it quietly behind the scenes. I would have liked to have heard from uh, Mr. Furukawa straight up about this. And you know what? If that class action lawsuit wasn't going on, we may have. I, I, that class action lawsuit is gonna be going on for a long time, I think. I think it's gonna be a while. We might be playing the Switch 2 and you might get like a $10 check in the mail or something if you were affected a bit with your Joy-Con drift, right? That happened, I remember, with the other OS, with the PlayStation 3. It took like a decade to get people checks for that thing. So uh, yeah, I I'm not holding my breath about that ending anytime soon. So most likely this won't even be advertised if they do fix that Joy-Con drift. But the fact that they are acknowledging it, even to investors, means that the issue was big enough for that to happen. They're apologizing, but now they have to take action. And hopefully that means that those Joy-Cons start to change in stores. And of course, we know in certain regions, they just told uh, customer service agents to just take the Joy-Con in and change it out. Hasn't been everywhere, it should be. Like I know in Europe, they, they believe you still have to pay to get it repaired. In uh, uh, Nintendo America just went ahead and changed them out. So that needs to be like the standard. And then they have to start changing and fixing the overall design of the Joy-Con so that they don't drift at least as much as they do. Controllers still drift overall, but it certainly was a bigger issue with the Joy-Con. And then as for the Nintendo Direct, something we have not seen in a while, and like I said, we might not see for a year even, like from the last one in September, Nintendo still says that they see it as a great way to deliver a message specifically about their games. And I would agree, whenever this next big General Direct happens, the hype is going to be through the roof. It really will be. I mean, when a Direct happens in the first place, people get really excited. And then of course, there's a lot of disappointment that follows because they have so many IPs, you really can't please everyone. But for the most part, a lot of us watch the Direct and we could pick out at least one thing that we get excited about. A lot of times multiple things in there. And the strange thing here is that Nintendo did say that they would look to adapt the Nintendo Direct in the future if they felt they needed to. And I almost wonder if that's because they're looking around at all of the other companies and they're all doing their own like direct, right? State of play, Microsoft is st is gonna start moving, I think to more pre-recorded stuff rather than their live stuff as well. And uh, I think Nintendo is looking at that and saying, we like to be different. So we're gonna try to do something different if we need to. And uh, to Nintendo, no, <laughs> don't do that. Don't mess up the Nintendo Direct formula. It is fine. I think we all like to get through a 30 minute presentation, relatively snappy, get some good announcements and then get out. Like it doesn't have to change. So here's hoping they step back and say, nah, the Direct's good. And here's hoping we get one sooner rather than later. You know, if they wanna do like a, a, a September thing and just make it exactly 365 days, Fine, but let, let's get another direct going here soon because right now the anything past Paper Mario looks uh looks looks kind of empty. Next up, let's talk about Crash Bandicoot 4. There there's been a lot of questions around microtransactions in this game. And that's of course is after the Xbox store listed in-app purchases next to the pre-order button. That sent everyone crazy all over the place. Like they're gonna put microtransactions in here, and I was thinking the same thing because, well. The store page says it, what are, what are we supposed to expect there? That's supposed to tell us information about the game itself. Well, Toys for Bob, of course, developing the game, working with Activision, decided to respond. And again, I'm sure Activision 
kind of had some input on this as well, but we can go over here to the tweet saying, we're seeing confusion about microtransactions in Crash Bandicoot 4 and want to be crystal clear, there are no microtransactions in Crash 4. They even went all caps on no microtransactions, wow. Uh, as a bonus, the totally tubular skins are included in all digital versions of the game. Here's my one concern about all of this, right? Activision said something similar when Crash Team Racing was coming out and, and then not too long after, I think it was like a month or two or so, we started to see microtransactions added in with an entire shop that got added in. Now you can still earn the stuff in game, but of course you can fast track your way there by buying currency and, and just being able to get things right away. It's strange to have that happen, but that is one of the drawbacks of the live service, right? Where you can change and alter the game after the fact, after you have purchased it. So while they, they're probably right, right? Oh, there's no microtransactions when the game comes out. If that game sells really well, I'm telling you, Activision might look at that and say, how can we work these in? Can we have a shop? Can we sell skins? That I'm sure will come up in the boardroom. We'll see if they execute it, but at least for now, Toys for Bob is saying no microtransactions in Crash Bandicoot 4. And I do believe them for launch. The question of course becomes, will this be another Crash Team Racing situation where you get quotes like these at different websites that say, oh, we have to go back and update this because now there are microtransactions in the game when our previous review said there would not be. Next up, let's talk about Paper Mario, the Origami King, as we did get a lot of information. Game Informer had an entire piece on this game talking with developers and producers about it. And uh, it doesn't sound like it is going to be a traditional Paper Mario game, but that could be good or bad depending on how you view some of the details that were laid out by Game Informer in their long interview that they have. Tons of information. I'll link it down below so you can go back through and read it. Uh, but to get started, where we saw the battle scene, of course, is supposed to be viewed as more of a puzzle than necessarily a traditional RPG battle setup where you will have moves and even a timer to kind of move around the different enemies to set them up for a very quick victory. Whether you jump in a line or smash with a hammer kind of in a row, it at least is set up more and more as it's been described as a Rubik's Cube to try to move characters around so that you can get this big, quick one turn victory. I, I don't mind creative battle systems being added into games like these, but I think we've had some creative battle systems in the Paper Mario recently, the whole series, and I really wouldn't have minded them just saying, you know what, just traditional RPG battle system, go. We're gonna give you this now. We'll see you next time for a very creative one. But I'm always open-minded for these kind of things. The big part that really caught me by surprise, this is going to be an open world game. Like, it's not gonna be divided into chapters. No, no, it's just big open world game, go. Okay, that could be pretty interesting. Now, I have still had questions about any progression for your character. It sounds like, again, not gonna be necessarily the same traditional EXP and all this to kind of level up. Uh, well, I gotta see how all that's gonna work out exactly. They've kind of alluded to it being a bit more simple, I guess, uh, but I do like the look of it. Like it looks super nice, right, from what they've shown. Very clean and creative with a lot of their areas that they have. And they also did talk about partners in the game, which got people really excited when they saw them, but they're not going to stick with you. Okay, so there will be certain areas, I guess, that they exist in, and that's it. It seems like it's gonna be very story-driven when it comes to your different partners. Uh, they will just have different sections of the game where you have them, but you will, of course, have your one character that goes with Mario all the way throughout. But from what I'm seeing, it's at least looking pretty good. It's definitely looking better than Color Splash and Sticker Star, which is, well, that's, that's at least a, on the right direction, right? We're hopefully heading up from here, but uh, we'll see, of course, that launches same day as Ghost, so uh, not too much longer, less than three weeks. And in our last bit of news, I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys an update on uh, some of the information we had yesterday, which had to do with the big Xbox July blowout event for third parties and seemingly some third parties thrown in there too. Check this tweet out here because we had a lot of information getting thrown out on Twitter yesterday. Tom Warren, for example, says Microsoft is sure gonna have a busy week of July 20th. It's Microsoft's Inspire Partner Conference that week and it's Xbox time. So that'd be the week of the 20th. And then Jeff Grubb also updated his list of his summer game mess with July week of, tw of the 20th, Xbox Game Studios reveal. And uh, I've, I've even been hearing myself that that would be the week. I did guess on the Spawncast the day of the 23rd. 
I'm still sticking with that. It was just, it's a guess, right? It seems like people are figuring out a window at least for this event. And I'm telling you that because I have had a lot of people ask about when they should start maybe planning out so they can be available for it. I'm wondering if it's going to be earlier in the day or if they're just gonna have a big prime time like, 8 p.m. Eastern event, right? Where it's this big thing at night and it's this you know, hour or two of all these first party studios. I don't know, I, I would prefer maybe even later on at night. I think that's fine. Although earlier in the day makes it easier to include it in news waves. So, uh, hey, Microsoft, you know, let's go with one o'clock Eastern. That would be perfect. Get everything in the news wave. Uh, but hey, I'm excited. Uh, and there you go. The week of the 20th is at least what I would uh, pencil in on your calendar for now. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Barack Obama, who apparently watches and even comments on these videos. This is pretty impressive. Can't wait to play Crisis in dynamic 540p, 25 frames per second on the Switch. So the interesting thing about Crisis is I am gonna say it'll probably be 720p or even 900p at 30 frames per second on the Switch. That might surprise some people, but it's gonna depend on what Saber can get out of this, because they, they did a pretty good job on The Witcher, and Crisis, I think, will be a bit more manageable on the Switch, especially compared to the PS3 and the 360 versions that ran at like this just under 720p at a pretty abysmal 25, 26 frames per second. It was kind of all over the place, but the Switch should be able to handle this game better than the PS3 and the 360. And I'm, I'm expecting 720, 30, that'd be docked. And yes, I do think it could be 540p at 30 in handheld mode, but of course they would uh, kind of take the sacrifice on the resolution for a more steady frame rate on a smaller screen that you might have a harder time seeing the differences in. But uh, that'll be very, very interesting to see how it actually translates over to the Switch later on this month. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit the like button, really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about today, whether there's Paper Mario, the Origami King. How, how do you think that's looking right now, especially if you're a longtime Paper Mario fan and you went through uh, a color splash? What do you think it's so far about, about this one here? And then what about Nintendo acknowledging the Joy-Con issues, giving kind of an apology, and then even talking about the directs as still being important, but, uh, we haven't seen one in a long time. When's the next threat gonna be, guys? Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.